You're listening to the Audacious Church Podcast. This message was recorded live at our Chester campus. We know this is a great investment into your life. So tune in, listen up and stay focused. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. Well, we are in our series, Why Did the Christian Cross the Road? And I, when I first saw this series title, I thought to myself, that's a great question. Why did the Christian cross the road? And I was waiting to slide on the next post of Instagram and see the punchline. But there was no punchline in there. It just, it just keeps you on the edge of your toes, doesn't it? That kind of series title, Why Did the Christian Cross the Road? I was trying to think of something clever to say, but I couldn't think of it in time. And uh, we're jumping in today. If you haven't um, been with us, um, check them out on the podcast, get involved. They have been absolutely amazing messages. But we're jumping in today and we're talking about a first aid faith. First aid faith. But before we get into it, I want to just talk to you about times that we've all felt disqualified. We've all been there, haven't we? Either in a big way or in quite a small but funny way. And uh, I've got a story to share with you. Can I, can I share a story? Can I be real with you today, church? So this story started back in PE. I was in high school and we had, you guys, when you have PE in the morning, isn't that just like the best? No maths in the morning, straight into PE. And uh, we had PE, I think it was second lesson. And there was rumors of an athletics competition in the afternoon. And I hadn't been picked. And I was like, oh, I only wanted to go because of the day off school. I, uh, I didn't actually want to do anything. I just wanted to go, have a day off school, see all my friends from all the other schools, from the region, all get together, all have a laugh. And we're playing football. And next minute, Sir calls me out of the game. And I'm thinking, what have I done here? What have I done? And he pulls me out. And he's like, Josh, I want you to go to the athletics tournament this afternoon. In my head, I'm just buzzing. I stop listening to what he's saying to me. I'm just thinking, I get to see all my pals. I've got the day off school. This is going to be fantastic. Didn't listen to any of the information that he was giving me. I didn't listen to what he actually wanted me to run, what he wanted me to do on track. I just said, yes, I'll be there. Yes, without even listening to the information I was being given. And then next minute, Sir just pulls out a hurdle. I looked back at the football pitch, saw every other guy that is more vertically enhanced than myself. I thought, why me? Have you ever had that moment where you said yes to something and then the reality catches up really quickly? I'm in this thing now. And he's like, right, the whole rest of the lesson, you can practice jumping over this hurdle. So I'm like, great. But the problem was there was only one hurdle. And when you run hurdles, you don't just jump over one. You've got to get into a rhythm and a stride to jump a full 100 meters over hurdles. So I got really good at jumping over the first one. (laughs) You can see what's coming, can't you? So we get to this athletics tournament in the afternoon. I get there and tie my laces. I'm stood at the start line of these hurdles. I look along at these actual hurdle runners thinking, what am I doing here? And I'd like to tell you this story's got a happy ending, but it doesn't. And uh, I'm stood there. I'm looking at the first hurdle, which comes up to my chest. And I'm thinking, what, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So I'm just like, right, I'm just going to go for it. All in. First hurdle. At least I've practiced that one. The rest of it, I'm told, take three steps and then jump again. We'll figure it out as we go. And I'm there. I'm in my own head. I'd completely disqualified myself from this race before it even got started. And... I just hear this, hear the gun go, start running, first hurdle, bang, flat on my face. (laughs) Everyone else is running elegantly, leaping over their hurdles. I'm lying on the floor, facing the tarmac. All of my pals that I I was seeing from all the other schools burst out laughing. It's like the whole arena is just like laughing. And I'm like, well, I've got to get back up. Second hurdle, bang, flat on my face. Third hurdle, I made it. Thank the Lord. Fourth hurdle, bang, flat on my face. Everyone had finished about five minutes before I'd got to the end. Luckily, I wasn't the only one that had fallen over. But it just shows the mentality, doesn't it? When you just say yes to something, you don't quite listen to the information, you get to the start line, and you just feel so disqualified 
for the moment. We've all had a time where we felt disqualified. In, in athletics, you know, we see that one false start can disqualify you from the whole race. There's this story of um, an American, Devin Allen, who was disqualified from the men's 110 meters because he was 0.099 of a second too early in reacting in the world championships. How just a moment too soon can disqualify us. We've all felt disqualified. Our disqualifications might be funny and lighthearted and a little bit embarrassing, like the story I've just shared, or our disqualifications might feel really heavy and really hard. Maybe you felt disqualified in life. Maybe you felt disqualified in church, in, in your workplace. You know, Maybe you've felt disqualified in helping someone through an addiction because of the own struggles that you've had yourself. Or you could have been disqualified from encouraging someone in their finances because you've been in debt and you're carrying the burden of, yeah, but I've been in debt, so how can I help this person in their journey of debt? Maybe you've been disqualified in helping someone with their faith because you've lived on the rocks yourself. You see, what we can do is we can fall into the trap of allowing moments and seasons of pain to define us. We can then live our lives identifying ourselves as victims, as being disqualified, rather than seeing ourselves as the victors that God has made us. You see, when we can overcome our disqualification, we are overcoming and celebrating the scars that we've picked up along the way. You don't need to live disqualified. God has got you. God is taking you through what you need to go through. We can live in shame, can't we? When we feel disqualified, shame can paralyze us. It can isolate us. We can feel immobilized. We do not help the person to our left and to the right. We are focusing on the pain rather than focusing on the purpose of the future. We label ourselves. This generation at the moment, I, when I was in high school, I used to reject any sort of label. Anyone would try and label me. I'd be like, I don't want it. Don't call me this. Don't, don't put that on me. It made me feel so, I don't know, sticky and uncomfortable. Like, you don't, you don't know me. How are you saying that this is who I am? But we've got a generation at the moment that are trying to label themselves left, right, and center and trying to find identity in the world and in the things around us. And we can be... So tempting for us to do that within our pain, for us to feel something, for us to go through a hard situation, and instead of look outside of it and look at what God's teaching us in the moment, say, no, I am now identified by this pain. I am a product of the pain that I have gone through. Well, I've got some good news. Anyone want good news today? Do you want some good news? The good news is God doesn't qualify the called. He call, no, other way around. Other way around. He does qualify the called. He doesn't call the qualified. Just keeping you on your toes then. Keeping you on your toes. <laughs> That's good news. Because that means that we can come into purpose with our disqualification. And God will take us from a place of feeling disqualified and put us into purpose. I want to be bold. Can I be bold for a moment? And say that it doesn't matter what pain you've been through. It doesn't matter what pain you're experiencing today. I know some of the band are carrying pain today, even if they're leading us. But they operated in their purpose regardless of the pain. You are not defined by your pain. You are defined by God. You are qualified because you are called. Every single person is called into relationship with God. And it is through this that we can cross the road. Why did the Christian cross the road? He crossed the road to administer first aid faith. It says in Luke 10, 33 to verse four, in the story that we're preaching off today, but a Sumerian, as he traveled, came to where a man was, and he saw him, and he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring out oil and wine 
And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. In the message version, it says he gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. We are all called to be a first aider, to administer first aid faith. But pressure off, because your role as a first aider isn't to find a solution, bring healing, or to restore, or to fix. That is not your role as a first aider. But what your role is, is to prevent, is to preserve, and is to promote. Preserve life. When you find someone in crisis, this is literally from first aid training. I was there on Thursday. Is your, your job as the first aider is to prevent the life, to preserve it. It's to prevent deterioration, and it's to promote recovery in God's house. When I look at this story, God really spoke to me about empathy. It says that he took pity on the man that he'd found. You see, empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Empathy comes from a soft heart. Empathy is what intrinsically motivates us towards action when we see someone else in need. Because if we've got a measure of empathy, it is impossible to move past the person that needs our help and needs our support. Church, can we all pray? We can all pray this prayer. God, give me empathy. Give me a greater measure of empathy so that I can administer first aid faith to the people around me. That I won't have a hard heart and be sheltered away from this God. But I will be full of empathy. I will be soft. And when I see someone hurting in my workplace, I'll have the boldness to administer first aid faith. When I see someone on the street that needs direction, I will administer my first aid faith. We are all called to be first aiders. We are all called to be first aiders. In church, I want to really quickly give us two things that if we're brave enough to let God into and let him get to work in our hearts and let him change something deep within ourselves and in our own pain, then that will free us to administer first aid faith out of our most painful places. Pain doesn't define you, but we can celebrate the journey that God's taken you through, through the painful season. I'm believing that right now as we go through these two things, that the Holy Spirit is going to move powerfully, and we're going to see people freed just in the speaking. Never mind when we get to the response. I'm believing that you're going to hear these words, and you're going to instantly be set free from scars, from pains, from glass ceilings that are keeping you restricted and out of service to administering a first aid faith to the people that need it most from you. God has put you around people to administer first aid faith to So church, can we just stand to our feet? I just want us to pray really quickly before we get into this. God, right now we acknowledge the power of the cross. Jesus, we acknowledge the freedom that you won for us when you took the pain of the cross upon yourself. Right now as a church, we step into the freedom that was won for us. God, we We call on your Holy Spirit now just to move in a way that is so powerful, so tangible. We acknowledge your presence here, the presence that has been in our service, the presence that lives within us all. And I just pray freedom right now, before we even get started, that there will be a freedom that we will see this room multiply out of the ability of administering a first aid faith that we didn't even know that we had. God, use us. Holy Spirit, move today. In Jesus' name. Amen. So the first thing you need to do, you can take your seats. The first thing you need to do to bring yourself into freedom out of victim and into victory is learn to celebrate the scars. Celebrate the scars. Scars are evidence of healing. Aren't they? The only reason we're scarred is because that shows there was a wound, but now it is healed. How good is God that he has created our bodies that we can heal, we can repair. It's the same in our spirit. Through the presence of God, we can bring healing to the wounds in our spirit. So we need to learn to celebrate the scars. Because when someone is healed in church, 
Do we celebrate it? Do we put it on all the group chats? Do we declare that God is good? It is true. That is what we do. So we are going to learn to celebrate the healing in our scars. There is a difference between open wounds and scars. And there are people in the room right now that have got open wounds. There are people in the room that currently are hurting, that it's sore, that you are bleeding. There's people on the podcast in the same way, and I just want to encourage you all with Psalm 147. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. I'm believing right now that when you keep coming into the presence of God and getting the right professional help, that God is and will continue to bind up your wounds. But also, can I encourage you to look around you? Who has God put in your life to administer some first aid? to help you out in your moment of hurting? Who is there that maybe you're a bit closed-eyed to? You blinkered off from seeing God has actually put them in your life. Maybe it's your small group leader. Maybe it's a friend. Or maybe it's the person that invited you to church today. Maybe God has put them in your life to be the first aider, to help you wind, bound up your wounds, take you to a place of healing. Once our wounds have got appropriate treatment, they can go through the healing process and become scars. In Genesis 50, 20, we see that Joseph is speaking and he's speaking to his brothers. Now, Joseph has been on a wild journey. He's been sold by his brothers, lied to that his father had died, said that he was trying to cheat with the Pharaoh's wife, trying to, I'm not gonna say the word I just thought of, that's, You see where I'm going. Um, tried to, to cause uncomfort in their house. Got chucked in prison for it. Then forgotten. And then much later was positioned as the prime minister. And what Joseph is saying is he's speaking to his brothers in this verse. And he's saying, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish is what is now being done. The saving of many lives. I want to prophesy that over you. You see, Joseph wasn't living bitter and living offended and paralyzed by pain. But he was able to celebrate the scars of his past and the things that he'd been through. And he was able to point his pain to the purpose that God had set out before him. Imagine if we could live the same. We could transform our pain into purpose. Point two, transform pain into purpose. It says, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, putting on wine and oil. He gave him first aid faith, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. I want to suggest that this wasn't his first rodeo. That maybe even, because we don't read much, maybe he'd been in the same situation. Maybe he'd been the guy that was bleeding out and that had wounds and it was left at the side of the road. Maybe he'd traveled this road a million times and God had given him a measure of empathy that said, I can no longer just walk past. You see, he came prepared with his first aid kit, ready to cross the road and administer first aid faith. We are all called to be like the Samaritan, to come prepared with the lessons that God has given us to help someone out in their moment of need. We are all called according to his purpose. See, God is on the move and God wants to use you to transform what is the most hurtful thing into the most powerful thing. We've pastored one of our young people for the last couple of years through an epic journey of fighting, resilience. There's been low moments. There's been tough moments. And I remember the first time that they really opened up to us about what was going on. I just said, Job, what the locust has stolen, God will restore it. That this pain that you're feeling right now, that your family are feeling right now, isn't going to disqualify you, but it's going to qualify you to speak into an area that no one else can. That God is going to use the pain, the hurt, the frustration, the lost, and He's going to use it to qualify you to preach and to speak into an area 
that no one else can preach and speak into. I wanna encourage you all that you are qualified. Each and every one of you, you are qualified to speak out. You're qualified to support. You're qualified to mentor. You're qualified to shepherd. You're qualified to pastor. You are qualified to teach. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Why is that so hard for me today? God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. I remember when I became a youth pastor, people used to say that to me all the time. Because I'd been on like a three-year journey of getting my life back with God before I became a youth pastor. And I felt so disqualified because the places I had been were the complete opposite of the places and the environments that I was now creating for young people to live in. But I first joined the youth team because God spoke to me, not through the good things I could do, but through the pain of where I had been and told me not to ignore the lack, not to ignore the pain, but to become the person that I needed to create a space and a place for young people so they don't have to experience it as well. When you are willing to look at your scars, when you're willing to look at the past with the eyes of God and invite God into it, He will use those scars to speak to you about the pain you experienced and about the future and about the purpose that He's got planned for you. We see it throughout businesses being born. There is always that early struggle, pain start. If you are in the early struggle, you are feeling the pain, the world is pushing back against you. Be encouraged, God is for you, God is with you. There is purpose in the pain. There is a first aider here in this church, in your small group, in your prayer group, ready to support you. But the first thing we do as first aiders is assess and we assess through conversation. Now, if the patient doesn't want to speak back to us and want to help us understand the pain they're going through, then there's nothing that we can do. So first aiders know that it is not your responsibility to fix, to heal, to restore. It is your responsibility to preserve, prevent, and promote. And then it is God's responsibility to heal, to restore, to recover, alongside the professionals that are <laughs> so good at what they do. First aiders, you're not counselors, you're friends. If someone needs counseling, speak to your leader, we will get them the support they need. There is a system in place to ensure that you as the first aider do not carry too much. You see, when there's a roadside accident, the first aider will respond. They'll assess, they'll preserve, they'll prevent, and they'll promote the recovery until the professional arrives to the scene. They will then take them to the hospital to receive the treatment that they need. This is the hospital. This church is the hospital. It is where God is. It is where God wants to move. It is where He's going to continue to move. Let's get people here. Let's encourage people into the house. So what's in your first aid kit? What is a first responder is in my first aid kit? The fruit of the Spirit. That's what we've got in our first aid kit. It says in Galatians 5, 22 to 23, but the fruit of the Spirit, the result of His presence within us. I just love that. I'm loving the Amplified Version, but the result of His presence within us is love, unselfish concern for others, inner joy, inner peace, patience, not the ability to wait, but how we act while we're waiting. How are you acting while you're waiting for the paramedics to arrive to the scene while you're administering your first aid faith? Are you coaching? Are you preserving? Are you preventing? Are you promoting? Or are you just letting them bleed out? People that are bleeding, how are you waiting for your first aid responder? How are you, how are you waiting while you're waiting for the paramedics to come onto the scene? 
Are you speaking to them? Are you bringing them in? Are you telling them where it hurts? Whether it's a nine or a two kind of pain, whether you need a bandage, whether you need a counselor, whether you need to speak to someone. See, patience is not the ability to wait, but how we act while we're waiting. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against all of these things, there is no law. These are the things that are in your first aid kit. Patience, kindness, love, joy, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What have you lived through that God can use for good in someone else's life? What the enemy meant for evil to hurt you, God will use it for good in someone else's life. If you can celebrate the scars and if you can trans let God in to transform the pain into purpose. What has God given you empathy for? What has God given you empathy for to fight against or for? Celebrate your scars with one another. Let God in to transform the pain into purpose. Cross over to the other side to help someone that is in need. So church, we're gonna to stand to our feet. all just to close our eyes for a moment. Because I want the people in the room that don't know Jesus, that haven't got a relationship with God, that right now in this moment are feeling completely disqualified from everything I've said because they don't have that, to come into a moment of relationship with Him where you are called and you are qualified to His plans, to his purposes over your life. You see, it is only through faith in Jesus that we can access the power of God of the cross. You see, when Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he'd taken on the journey of the cross, his scars didn't vanish. They hadn't disappeared. They were still there but they were there redeemed. They were there is the evidence of the journey that Jesus went on to, for the victory for you and for me. See, Jesus went through a road of pain, of lies, of abandonment, of people whipping, abusing, all to have a moment on the cross where he said, God it is done, it is finished so that we can all come into a relationship with God. So it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, I want you to know that you are called, that you are qualified in Him. Thank you for listening to this Audacious podcast. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. We'd love for you to join us at one of our campuses, Manchester, Chester, or online every Sunday, 10 a.m. and 12 p.m.